Thank you very much. I would like first to uh, start with uh, um, thanking the organizers, uh, Gabor uh, um, and uh, his team for bringing us again to this beautiful city and uh, this nice conference on the important topic. And I will also apologize to Gabor because um, the, um, I will start out with a provocative question. And uh, does the tear of depleted water really work? And uh, if it does, how? So uh, we are scientists here, and of course, everyone here believes that uh, it works one way or another. But say, um, not everyone convinced in the rest of the world. And if we, uh, if we take that position of skepticism and try to see what is the objective evidence for deuterium depleted water to work since this landmark paper of Gabor and the team and uh, preventing uh, water being on the market for more than two decades. And so, uh, why would skepticism arise? Well, um, the concentration of deuterium is so small that's, that's how normal argument goes. One atom out of 6,000 um, protons, there's one deuterium. And so this is artistic representation of this ratio. There's 6,000 dots, I'm sure everyone can count, on this, uh, on this uh, picture. And one of them is different. And it, is, uh, it represents deuterium. Where it is? Sure, everyone found it. <laughs> so, and then we change this ratio, one to 8,000, one to 10,000. What difference can it possibly make? Okay, let's look at literature. There are dozens and dozens of paper published, papers published, but we we'll look at more or less the cancer, um, cancer uh, research as well as um, effect on human normal cells. And we see that there is overwhelming uh, evidence that um, that uh, there is an effect and there is an anti-proliferation effect, all these papers. There are some um, uh, occasional reports of heavy no effect, but this is for normal fibroblasts. And uh, there are some other papers on different organisms, human as well as mouse and uh, uh, tissues and cell lines and, and different kinds of cancer. And so there's a, a Largely uh, evidence uh, for this uh, um, deteriorated water to work, but there are also reports of no significant effect found on cell lines and so on. So we decided to test um, using our approaches, and besides doing science, we also run a service lab, actually two service labs in proteomics. One of them is devoted to chemical proteomics, and chemical proteomics is the fast-growing field where people who work with their uh, drug development, they come up with a molecule that works, but they don't know how. So they bring this molecule to us, and we will, we will do, we do the cell work. We treat these cells with this molecule and other molecules, and we tell them the drug target, the mechanism of action, the binding site, uh, the mechanism of cell death, the changes in the redox state. We do all that with the uh, chemical proteomics. And we have become exceedingly good at this. So people trust us, and um, in our experience, in most cases, we can provide uh, a, a definite answer. And in, in all cases, we can provide a reasonable answer. And this is interesting because uh, drugs are promiscuous, and it's very rare that a drug would affect just one molecule. So. Uh, one protein, therefore, uh, people want to know the off targets and they want to know the whole repertoire of targets that engage a different um, concentration of drug. We're using mass spectrometry. Uh, we're using the most sophisticated type of mass spectrometry, it's called the Orbit Track. Here is an inventor, Alexander Makarov. It's a Euro East European connection with his Orbit Track. And it's, uh, we used to use huge instruments with a superconducting magnets, very expensive liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, but now there's a little thing. So we have seven such instruments in our laboratory that work 24 seven. We don't believe one piece of information, one evidence. We request uh, at least two different techniques to come with the same answer. 
And actually, uh, we apply typically three techniques. One is called thermal proteome profiling, another is called FITEX, and the third one is redox proteomics, and I'll tell you what it is. So redox proteomics is easier. We uh, measure what percentage of thiols found in cysteine residues are engaged in the sulfur bond. In the cells, people usually say uh, there is no disulfate bonds. That's not true. About 10% of uh, cysteines on average are engaged in disulfate bridging normally and if you treat the cells with uh, drugs reducing oxidative stress, this percentage can go to 20 or higher. So we measure this and we measure which peptides and which proteins actually um, create disulfate bond upon treatment and which one break the disulfate bond upon treatment. Then the second method is called FITEX, so functional identification of targets by expression proteomics. Here we'll look at the changes in the protein abundance. And what we found is that these changes are specific to the mechanism of action. And in order to increase the specificity, we typically use contrasting drugs. We also treat the cells with other agents with a known mechanism of action. And then we compare the changes on the protein mm -hmm. level or one drug against all other, pro uh, all other drugs. And that allows us to uh, be very specific and find even small changes, as small as 10% in the abundance change, that are specific for this particular drug. And that gives us typically the top candidate is the uh, uh, drug target and also we, we take top 100 or so candidates and put them on the pathways and we get the mechanism of action. And we're using a method called OPLSDA to do that. So here is one drug is contrasted to 54 other drugs and all dots here represent a protein with abundance change and uh, the, uh, the drug was metatrixate and it has a cognate target which is called DHFR dihydroxyphalate reductase and you see this protein is DHFR, it's an outlier and uh, you can bet your farm you your house that uh, this is a target uh, of this drug and it is indeed. So the proteins of interest are here, they are specifically upregulated in response to the drug and all this also here they are specifically downregulated in response to the drug. So here Paclitex cell, uh, it, it is known to engage better tubulins and here all, all these molecules are better tubulins. So by applying this method we can easily determine uh, the, the targets. And the third method is called thermal proteome profiling. So my firm, my graduate student, Misha Savitsky, who is now a group leader in EMDL, has come up with this uh, method, as well as Per Nurlun, who is, um, um, was professor in our department, and he moved to another department. Uh, this method is also known as SETSA, that Per Nurlun's original um, idea, but now it's brought to the level of the whole proteome and um, the idea is the following. Uh, all proteins come in two kinds, chicken egg proteins and chicken soup proteins. Chicken egg proteins, when you boil them or you increase the temperature, they unfold and become less soluble. Um, and chicken soup proteins become even more soluble if you heat them up. About two thirds of all proteins are chicken egg type, they unfold. And for these proteins, this method works and essentially you heat your sample to different temperatures and then you measure the protein abundance of the soluble part and then for each protein you get so-called melting temperature curve uh, and then you can determine this melting temperature and the idea is when the drug binds the solubility or the stability of the protein changes and so the curve shifts but it only shifts if the protein interacts with the drug if it doesn't then the curve doesn't shift so we measure these curves two times with and without the drug, and of course in replicates, and then measure the shift, salt the proteins by the shift, and the top guys win. And the shift can be, can be both directions, could be positive or negative. Here again we apply the same OPLSDA method. This is a drug, and it's actually a kinase inhibitor. All these red molecules that are specifically shifted in positive direction or negative uh, in response to this drug, as opposed to all other drugs and uh, there were uh, nine drugs in total. These are the kinases, and this is the inhibitor. So we can compare also this method, TPP, thermal protein profiling, with FITEX, which is based uh, on uh, abundance change. And so you see um, here is an outlier. 
and it starts the uh, protein called thymidylate synthase. And <coughs> again, you can bet that this is a this is a correct target because two methods show the same thing. Okay, now we uh, we plan this study very carefully. We decided first we tried with three cell lines, and we decide we took them from literature uh, on deuterium depleted water. We will see which one uh, is responding best to deuterium depleted water, if any. Then we determine the concentration of deuterium at which the effect is the strongest. So we'll take this cell line and this deuterium concentration, and then add to the panel drugs, some drugs which we know very well, and uh, we will uh, uh, adjust the concentration of this drug so they would induce the same biological effect. That's very important uh, as the tear depleted water. And then we will apply our three methods, redox proteomics, TPP, and FETEX, and we will see which proteins will come uh, and appear in the, the short list coming from at least two different methods. So the first one, it turns out that A509 cells, which were also used in the in previous talks, um, they were most sensitive to uh, deuterium depleted water. And um, uh, we actually created it by taking 1.1 ppm water and adding, uh, adding heavy water and then mixing up very, very carefully. The mix-up process takes about seven days. We, we mix up while increasing the temperature to 70 degrees and cooling down, increasing and cooling down. That's what we learn and other people will learn. It is very important to mix uh, with water. It, just is, it is true that there is no such thing as water. Everything is a solution. But at the same time, there is no such a thing as solution in water. So there are studies of American group that apply, employed a um, very sophisticated technique and that showed that that water and methanol never really truly mix at the molecular level. If you replace methanol with ethanol, then you come close to real life. And um, I remember, as once Professor Lobyshev uh, told me that at one conference, he said, if you mix, if you take 60% of water and 40% of alcohol, mix them up, you do not get vodka. And every <laughs> Russian knows that. It tastes horrible. So, but if you, if you mix them up, them up uh, in the, um, um, for a long time, or if you use them in steam, and they will condense together, then you get something palatable. So um, that really reflects the fact that it's, it's difficult to mix up properly even, even uh, uh, water and alcohol, but water and heavy water is equally difficult to mix. So it's very important. Actually, Barnes has uh, reported this back in 1930s, that it's very important to mix up properly things. Anyway, so it turns out that the effect is there where it's about 30% decrease in the uh, cell count. So suppression of cell growth. But it reaches maximum at 80 ppm. And if we, we, we go down, and we actually could uh, go down to 70 ppm, there is no effect anymore. And here we differ from some other groups that claim that deuterium is important and no deuterium, no life. We don't see that. Human cells grow at uh, essentially deuterium-free uh, uh, situations as well as in normal conditions. That's our experience. The other cell lines are even less sensitive to this. So we decided to work now with 80 ppm water. And then we, um, um, we took these uh, three drugs, uh, methotrexate, campothecin, and paclitax cell. We know them very well. They have different mechanisms of action. We know their um, targets very well. And then we adjusted the concentration so that um, the cell growth would be depressed by 30%, just like the tube depleted water. And then we grew the cells, A509 cells, in these conditions, in deuterium depleted water and it, with three drugs. And the measure the proteome, and you see here uh, how the, this is a two-dimensional principal component analysis. You see how, uh, um, if, uh, this is normal water, how every treatment changed the proteome. And then we'll look at the uh, outliers and uh, which ones. So we got, uh, in the expression analysis, we got a short list of proteins which are specifically 
upregulated in response to deuterium depleted water and specifically downregulated in response to deuterium depleted water, as opposed to all other drugs. And then we did redox proteomics. Again, we have labels. So first we label all cysteines which are free with some label, and then we uh, reduce the remaining disulfid bonds and label them with a different label, isotopically different. And so, and then we do mass spectrometry and we can measure the ratio between these two labels and then gives us the uh, percentage of uh, free thiols and those disulfid bonds. So it turns out that uh, a deuterium depleted water increases the percentage of oxidation. Actually, there's, uh, uh, these numbers uh, should be taken with a grain of salt because uh, normal treatment proteomics um, preparation increases the, uh, the, um, uh, the percentage, so you, you will be safe if you remove, uh, subtract about maybe six units from here, so this should be 10%, and then it will be 20%. But what's interesting is that we're also working with a drug called aranofine, and is known to induce oxidative stress. And we found that a certain concentration, the tumor depleted water, induces more um, uh, oxidation of um, disulfan bonds than even our anophine. And then we look at which proteins and which peptides um, they are more um, affected in terms of disulfan bond creation, and particularly this P56 protein was there. And, um, and then we uh, did the melting temperature uh, experiment, the uh, uh, TPP experiment, and we look at the uh, shifts, the positive direction and negative directions. So we got these three lists of proteins, and then we try to merge them and see which proteins show up in at least two out of three lists. And then we <coughs> did pathway analysis on these proteins and found out that most of them are coming from mitochondria, and they engaged in the oxidative stress response. And um, upon reading literature, how things might work, we found some analogies with, uh, with other drugs so we use, um, uh, that induce oxidative stress. So we came up with this um, model, which, is, uh, which doesn't have everything in place, but at least, <coughs> at least provides certain, uh, um, certain idea what might happen. And then again, uh, the mitochondria, the inner membrane, and there is a gradient of protons, but there's also a gradient of deuterium. And normally, it has been pointed out before, normally uh, within, the concentration of deuterium is, is lower than outside of the membrane. And this is because um, the uh, uh, de deuterium comes from lipids and it's naturally depleted. So that's a normal situation. But there's less deuterium inside than outside. But when you put cells in deuterium depleted water, all of a sudden the situation is reversed. There is less deuterium outside than inside. And uh, this, uh, um, upsets, this upsets the, the production of reactive oxygen species, which is normally uh, going on. And to restore the equilibrium, this um, uh, uh, production increases. So there's more was produced. But when you further reduce the amount of deuterium, there is a safety valve mechanism uh, that opens up and restores the equilibrium by force. We have not invented this mechanism, it's very well known. So, um, and it's this model, as I said, is used in other situations to explain what's going on when you increase the concentration further, but the rust production suddenly stops and, and reverses. So, um, how to uh, prove, verify these findings? After all, proteomics, what it does, it gives you a prediction. You have to verify this prediction by some other means. If uh, everything that boils down to the oxidative stress, then we can test these hypotheses by um, uh, trying to um, <coughs> negate this effect by adding antioxidant. N-acetylcysteine is the anti, uh, antioxidant that is most frequently used in these kind of studies. So if we, uh, if we don't add it, the uh, uh, reduction in cell growth is uh, like 75% here in this experiment. We also use the drug aranofine as a, as a positive control. And so we adjusted the concentration so they will also reduce by the same amount the, the growth rate. 
And then we had an increase in concentration of NAC. And uh, sure enough, the effect, the reduction of the cell growth diminishes, both for ironophene and deuterium depleted water. And at some concentration, about two millimolar of NAC, then the effect is statistically gone. This is ironophene. It actually has a gold atom inside. It's a drug that is normally used for um, arthritis, but now it's repurposed against cancer. And then if this is true, then the, uh, the uh, use of deuterium depleted water and ironophene together should have a synergistic effect. And so that's what exactly what is happening when we started to add ironophene to deuterium depleted water then we see that um, the effect um, on the cell reduction um, increases. The cell growth diminishes more. And so, uh, especially at low concentrations, and this is a ratio between um, deuterium depleted water and uh, without deuterium depleted water. So, uh, in fact, the, the cell number goes down with the concentration of aronophene, but the effect of deuterium depleted water uh, actually diminishes with high concentration of ironophene, which also makes sense because uh, you don't need two, uh, two sources of reactive oxygen species. But at low concentrations of ironophene or medium concentrations, there is a, a double whammy effect. There is a positive effect of the deuterium depleted water. And um, we calculated here uh, the rust production by uh, biochemical assays, which is not proteomics at all. This is a standard assays that um, uh, the um, bio biochemists are using, and we show that indeed there is increased production of um, uh, reactive oxygen species uh, when, uh, in um, ATP PM deuterium depleted water compared to normal control. And this is our anophine, and this is these two together, our anophine plus deuterium depleted water. All these validations were requested by the reviewers. And reviewers uh, requested validation upon validation upon validation. They also wanted to look at the uh, time effect, what happens during the treatment. And here we treated the cells uh, with normal water, 17 uh, ppm uh, deuterium depleted water, 80 ppm deuterium depleted water, and ironophene and the concentration that induces approximately the same biological effect. And sure enough, after four hours, we already see the separation in terms of ROS production between um, uh, these two are 80 ppm and aronophene, and these two are 17 in normal water. And then this effect continues to 48 hours and, and more. So uh, that was reviewers have asked us. This paper has gone through three reviews, and each time they requested more and more information. And apparently, the, it was it was clear that they didn't like some of the reviewers didn't like the subject. But the evidence was overwhelming, and after a while, I had to <laughs> give up. And so now, paper is published. It's on the web already. It's in a journal called Molecular and Cell Proteomics, which is the most prestigious proteomics journal. And they even requested a figure for the cover. Uh, of this uh, of this journal, so that's how it should look like. It's not there yet, and I checked, but uh, but it will be. Okay. So uh, now we know that the molecular mechanism of um, the deuterium depleted water is upsetting the mitochondria, the balance between ROS production and ROS neutralization, and um, that's great. But is it the final story? or not, or maybe there's something behind it. Let's say, let's look at starvation. Uh, you starvation has a defined molecular mechanism. You look at starved cells, their proteome changes, their metabolome changes, transcriptome changes, autophagy kicks in, the cell morphology changes, a lot of changes. You can study this forever. And you can see, you know, who interacts with whom. And yet, and yet, the um, starvation has a very, very simple explanation, a very basic one. It's the law of conservation of energy. No food leads to death, okay? And so that reminds 
It reminds us of an old uh, joke about a man who tried to teach his donkey not to eat. And he almost succeeded, but the ungrateful donkey has died before the, before the teaching course was completed. <laughs> so knowing the law of conservation of energy, you can predict the outcome of the experiment without knowing the details of the molecular mechanism. Forget about the molecular mechanism. So if the general law um, uh, acts. So the question is whether there is any general law behind the EDTU depleted water. And if there is, what this law might be. Um, I want to make another East European connection. Uh, this year uh, in Russia they celebrate 150 years of the discovery of Mendeleev's periodic table. And there was a congress in St. Petersburg a few weeks ago. And uh, this is the original piece of paper where Mendeleev, 1969, is uh, put at the masses. Actually, it was mass, without mass picture, there was masses of elements. What did he see that no one else could see? He saw order where no one could see it and everyone else has seen chaos. So the question is uh, whether there is order in this table. And this is a table of masses and abundances of isotopes. It doesn't seem like there is any order, but uh, maybe we don't have the glasses to look at. And these glasses could be provided by uh, two-dimensional mapping. And one dimension is so-called normalized mass defect, NMD. And if you look at the mass of a biomolecule, it has a nominal mass which is integer mass for all isotopes. So this is a number of uh, nucleons, as the physicists would say. And then you have a monoisotopic mass, which is shifted compared to the normal mass. And this, this is a mass defect. It can be positive, can be negative, but for peptides and proteins, it's always positive. And then you have a distribution of isotopes, and you can measure the average mass, the average isotopic mass, and there is a difference between it and the monoisotopic mass, and it's uh, called normalized isotopic shift. The, this difference divided by nominal mass multiplied by 1,000 here is also divided by nominal. So if we use two of these uh, values, and the first value refers to these digits after decimal point of the accurate mass of the most abundant isotope, and it's a universal constant. It's the same for the whole universe. Nothing can change this. So the first dimension is set. But the second dimension refers to the abundance of this isotope and it's easily changed. So these two dimensions are truly independent and when we plotted, and it was some time ago, 10 years ago, um, so we plotted uh, 3,000 peptides from mouse liver on the plot. What we expected to see is chaos, <laughs> galaxy. What we saw was order. We saw this line and uh, we spent uh, weeks and weeks after this August 2008, uh, trying to find out what this order might be, <coughs> what it was due to. It turns out the molecules here on the uh, uh, line, they uh, account to this equation, no sulfur. The number of hydrogen is two no times number of carbon minus number of nitrogens, and you can have any number of oxygens. So we introduce a Z value, which is C minus N plus H over two. If Z is negative, these um, molecules below the line account for that. If Z is zero, you have a line, Z positive above the line. And we'll look at the uh, amino acid residues. Turns out that most of them have Z equal to zero and the ones that are actually in the beginning of life. And we'll also look at organic molecules found in meteorites and calculated Z value for them. It turns out that Z value is really the pinnacle of this distribution. It's the most probable value. So it's the, it represents the simplest molecules. And we came up with isotopic resonance hypothesis that says that isotopic resonance reduces complexity of molecular system with Z equal to zero. Complexity reduction leads to faster kinetics. Z equal to zero represents the simplest and most abundant classes of molecules formed spontaneously. And if so, early life could have been helped by the terrestrial isotopic resonance to emerge <coughs> to take root on the planet of Earth. It was a very bold statement. We essentially said, we know why life occurred here on this planet because we happen to have this isotopic resonance. 
And so the basis of this hypothesis is, um, is a notion that less complex systems are in general faster. Simply means faster. So you have a two system with the same number of elements and links, but one is highly symmetric one and the other one is chaotic. Which one would react on a random stimulus faster? Well, the suggestion is this one will because of the symmetry. And uh, is there any evidence of the um, effect of symmetry on net kinetics? Yes, there is. In formation of ozone, ozone can have three, 10 isotopomers because the 10 combination of isotope 16, 17, and 18, they can be found. And so the rate of formation of each of these 10 isotopomers has been measured experimentally. 6, 7, 8 means 16, 17, 18. Turns out that the most stable ones, the most produced with the highest efficiency was the least symmetric one and all uh, most symmetric ones, monoazotopic, 16, 16, 16, 17, 17, 17, 17, and 18, 18, 18, they had the lowest rate of formation. There is a mass effect, as you can see, but the symmetry effect is bigger than the mass effect. So the Nobel Prize winner, Rudy Marcus, has explained it in this 2001 paper in Science that the symmetry reduces the number of quantum mechanical states because of the degeneracy and that, uh, that leads to uh, essentially hotter molecules that form at the same rate but these ones are hot inside and they decay faster. That's the explanation. Hot inside also means more reactive. And therefore we apply the same logics. Uh, without the isotopic resonance, you know, to calculate the average molecular mass you need to know 14 parameters, all these masses and abundances. If there is an isotopic resonance, you only need to know six parameters, four masses and the parameters of the line, A and B. And if the line is flat, then five parameters. It's even further reduction of complexity. 14 parameters versus six or five. That's a great reduction in complexity. And therefore, the suggestion was in the presence of isotopic resonance, the system becomes more symmetric, that means less complex, and this leads to hotter chemistry, faster chemistry, faster kinetics. And uh, we spent three or four years trying to test this hypothesis experimentally. Uh, its predictions are the following. The conventional theory says that if you increase the percentage of heavy isotopes, the kinetics goes down slowly. But our prediction is that, yeah, there is a slope, but then on, on, uh, against the slope there must be some values that hit the resonance and at these values the rate of reaction should increase. And we tested that on growing E. coli and measuring the growth parameters. E. coli is very well behaving um, 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 biological system. It's a, it's a bacterium and it grows on almost anything. Um, it grows on uh, any amino acid, it can grow on uh, on uh, glucose, so it's very easy to manipulate with uh, isotopic uh, uh, compositions. The first resonance that we tried to test was this 3.5 percent of nitrogen 15. Normally it's 0.36 percent, so this is 10 times the normal concentration. And at this concentration, all other isotopes being the same, the f this uh, line with z equal to zero becomes uh, like this, it loses its slope. So that should reduce, uh, the flat line uh, should lead to further reduction in complexity and something should happen. So we did thousands of experiments on very accurate instrument, that's what we got. We got a confirmation and they just showed us a few pieces of data, we, we have many more. And actually uh, after this was published and I gave talks here and there and one of the talks I gave was in Stockholm University and one, uh, one researcher, of Russian origin, she was incredulous, she didn't believe. And so she was working with a uh, water organism, Yelena Gorokhova, and she started to grow them, uh, changing the isotopic composition. And sure enough, she found the same thing. So this is 3.5% N15, this is N15 increase. You see there is a, a slow increase in some parameter they measured, and then boom, there's a sudden drop. And here again, a slow decrease, and then boom, sudden increase, and this is 3.5% N15. So they published this paper, and there is another study that also showed that on another organism, that's now algae, it turns out that 3.5% in 15 uh, is really uh, an outlier in the growth. So the growth normally goes like this, and then boom, collapses here to this point again. 
Therefore, at least one other group has confirmed one of our predictions, and it was in the strongest resonance that we um, provided in this paper, in scientific reports. It was held to publish. The other reviewers were uh, really tough. But anyway, um, after this paper was published, I started to think about what can we do next. And I was thinking about water, and according to our hypothesis, uh, the resonance, terrestrial resonance, this one, can be improved because this line has some width. And if you double the amount of deuterium to about 300, 400 ppm, this line becomes mathematically thin. And uh, if so, the, the rate of reactions, the rate of growth, should further increase. And if you continue to increase the amount of deuterium, this line becomes diffuse, and then deuterium toxic effects so sets in, so there's a fallout thing. And then if you decrease the amount of deuterium, again, the line becomes diffuse. But if you further remove the deuterium, then um, you remove the complexity associated with the isotope, and the, uh, the line should improve somewhat. So we call this uh, deuterium depleted region slow water, and we predict the existence of fast water. And I thought, this must be known already, because people worked with deuterium for, uh, for a long time. And I started to look in literature, couldn't find anything. And then one night, I switched to Russian and started to look at the Russian literature, and I found a review from, from Lobachev. And, uh, and there, there were references from 1930s. And of course, in my database, in Google as well, Google knows nothing about 1930s, didn't exist, because these papers are not uh, digitized and they're not really searchable. And so they exist in PDF, but they're not searchable yet. And therefore, you know, nothing that Google can find exists in our world. Right. Anymore, but fortunately, some people still work with paper literature, and and so through a Lobachev review, I found that indeed they um, uh, they did a lot of experiments. This is just one of them. And so this is one single reaction. This is a molecular level reaction. Sodium potassium ATPase activity increases by 50 percent when you increase the amount of deuterium to 400 ppm, and then slowly fall off. So this is a very strong uh, resonance effect, but of course very hard to explain. And we try to uh, uh, test um, this reaction and we, um, how to measure this sodium potassium uh, activity, uh, TPS activity. We turned to the professionals and they told us that uh, the modern kids have at the end luciferase. It gives light and that's how you measure. So we decided to skip all these intermediate steps and just look at the effect of luciferase activity and um, we work with the company that produces these luciferase kits so they supposedly know what they're doing because this is their bread and butter they uh, produce these kits and they sell them and they guarantee that the kits are uh, high quality and the kit are reproducible so we changed the water content and we did three experiments this is just one of them uh, completely independently each time we received the same effect and uh, but the best effect was obtained in the third experiment. We mix the water very, very carefully, so for, for seven days. And that's how we learned it. And the effect was the following. The luminosity increase uh, drops by 30% when the, uh, deuterium uh, when the deuterium is increased by a factor of two. This may seem puzzling why we expected an increase, but here we have a decrease. But one should remember that all reactions go in both directions. So an increase in kinetics may affect these reactions differently, and the net effect may be actually increased in the rate of the opposite reaction. So uh, actually, um, even Barnes from 1930s reported a decrease in the reaction at increased deuterium content. That was the uh, fermentation. Uh, fermentation is uh, reduced, and the fermentation occurs better at deuterium depleted conditions. And that's why people buy ice from Greenland to brew beer. Well, anyway, that confirms that water actually affects not the whole organism. You don't need mitochondria here. This is a simple reaction. And, uh, and then we started to look at the structure of water. If things are in water, we, we look again at this Gun, uh, Gancheruk paper uh, published in 2013 and plotted their data. And you see, it's very strange. They have this, this sudden increase and the effect is pretty pretty high, you know, there's a few percent change and then discontinuity. So we decided to test these predictions and we contacted 
a company that produces arguably the most accurate instruments is Anton Parr, and this is their new Lovis 2000 microviscosimeter. Uh, we actually tested two models. One is less accurate, it has an accuracy of 10 to the minus 5. This has an accuracy of 10 to the minus 6, this precision. And what we were testing is this. Water by itself should be resonant in terms of deuterium. And so when you look at the ratio between normalized aspect shift and normalized mass defect, the prediction is when this ratio hits uh, a whole number, then you should have a resonance. And when the number is one, the resonance has to be stronger. And this happens at 3,000 ppm of deuterium. And then the second resonance occurs at 400 ppm. So when it becomes resonance of 100 ppm, that's the prediction. But also 3,000, that's, uh, that's a normal prediction. This is fast water, but this was unknown before. We decided to test it, and we spent weeks and weeks measuring the, uh, the density of water, 4 degrees Celsius, uh, at different uh, conditions, at different deuterium content. And of course, there is a slope. You asked yesterday whether there was a slope. There is a slope. So they had three replicates. But, uh, so we got this uh, result showing that there is a drop in, uh, in um, density at 3,000 <coughs> ppm, the p-value is 10 to the minus 3. It was very encouraging results. But when we started to measure things more accurately, the fact uh, was reduced, and then we, fo we found that we need to degas things, so essentially we need to do it over again, and we just dropped this project or put it on ice. It still waits to be... Um, Green and ice. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but basically, basically, we're interested in this branch of uh, of the uh, curve that Gabor has reported uh, 26 years ago. Uh, this is increase in the growth. He was interested in decrease on the growth of cells. We were interested in the increase. <coughs> and uh, if you look at this, his results, and here are our results. This is a deuterium depleted. Uh, study that I showed to you on N509 cells, and this is actually continuation of this study towards deuterium enrichment. And you see there's a line going on. It looks like deuterium concentration is a regulator factor that regulates biology, regulates the growth of cells uh, within a certain interval. And outside this interval is no more regulation, but this is not unusual <coughs> in biology. Deuterium is not the only one. So maybe that's a uh, that's a mechanism that nature uses to, uh, to regulate growth. I don't know why. But let's, uh, this is our planet. Let's look at other planets. Other planets have a different deuterium content. And uh, as I said yesterday, Venice has 100 times more deuterium. Mars has 7 times more. So this is uh, increase the deuterium content in Mars <coughs> uh, from the uh, Curiosity mission. And the question is whether um, we already sent people on Mars, according to Hollywood, and the eight foot grown on Martian, uh, uh, Martian soil, which is enriched with deuterium. The question is whether it will be healthy. And we look at the um, azotopic resonance on Mars. This is Earth. We see the clear resonance. Here there is no resonance. Therefore, they said life on the Mars is unlikely. But whether Martian conditions were good for human organism or not, we tested on these uh, shrimps. These are the only organism, according to NASA, that can survive for several years in completely closed environment where only sunlight comes in. And we look at the survival of this um, organism. It took uh, two and a half years of this experiment. Uh, so we found that actually it's the survival is decreased at the Martian conditions. So we could uh, say something about the biosphere without uh, going uh, through all these level of organization just based on the azotopic compositions using the general, general law. So the conclusions are, deuterium depleted water works. On a molecular level, it works through induction of oxidative stress in mitochondria. In a more fundamental sense, at least in our opinion, it works through isotopic resonance. It can be used with benefit in cancer therapy as an adjuvant to drugs that induce oxidative stress, and that's we, these are the wordings that we put in our paper. Antioxidants cancel the effect of uh, deuterium with the water, and they also cancel the effect of traditional uh, anti-cancer drugs that are based on uh, oxidative stress effect. 
Deuterium concentration seems to be a biological regulator. I would like to point out that uh, isotopic resonance can be um, also a piece of art. It can be a, um, a inspiration for art. These are, these are paintings, uh, another painting, and uh, these are paintings on the wall in front of our laboratory. So this kind of a contemporary art museum, a small one. <laughs> I would like to thank my research group, uh, the former members, uh, collaborators, uh, companies, funding agencies, and thank you very much for your attention.